looks dangerous out there. I admit I'm feeling nervous. Just a few metres below is one of the most active volcanoes on the planet. Locals call it El Discreto, the secret one. I've joined a team from the Volcanological Institute in Volcan. A police helicopter has taken us up to the eruption zone, two kilometres off the Canary Island of El Hierro. Until a few months ago, relatively few people had heard of the volcano in the Atlantic, west of Africa. Now it's drawing experts from around the world. Jose Barrancos Martinez and his team have flown over the site about 20 times since eruptions began last October. They take gas samples and images with heat-sensitive cameras. The crater is some 100 metres below the ocean surface. It's constantly emitting gases. A few weeks ago, lava shot up into the air. The researchers have their lab on the neighbouring island of Tenerife, where they analyse their data. For them, the eruption off El Hierro is like hitting the jackpot. I join Jose and his team leader, Nemesio Perez Rodriguez. They tell me it's rare for scientists to see the birth of a volcano at such close quarters, and possibly they'll see yet more. I found archives, documents, historicals. Nemesio Perez Rodriguez tells me there's evidence in 17th century record of a much older eruption, before 1492. That went on for more than two years. If this one lasts that long, it could lead to the birth of a completely new island. Just a small one, but still a new island. It all depends on how long the eruption lasts, he says. Jose explains that all the Canary Islands were created in a similar way, from cooling lava. So, in geological terms, this is not an unusual event, but the dangers to people are real. Nemesio Perez Rodriguez says this eruption is occurring to the south of the island because the rock there is unusually thin and weak. But it's quite possible that there could be a similar eruption on El Hierro itself. He says they've put in place monitoring mechanisms which can be expanded as necessary. I take a plane from Tenerife back to El Hierro. How do people there feel so close to an active volcano? What's the impact on their lives? On the road, I meet Fatima Rodriguez and Maria Cordera. They're also volcanologists. They spend every day travelling around the island, taking gas samples and measuring the temperature and deformation of the ground. Before a past eruption, the surface distorted by four and a half centimetres. Fatima explains that measurements like this are key to predicting when an eruption could occur. At the moment, the situation is stable, she explains. But that could change as matters develop. We simply can't tell how things will go. We assume it will stay quiet, thankfully. But it's very important to keep on watching, so we know what awaits us. The collected data is used to draw up contingency plans to evacuate the island. Fatima explains that one village in the south of the island, La Rastinga, has already been cleared twice. I decide to take a look. I stop just outside the village. This sign explains that the area off the coast here is a nature reserve called Mar de las Calmas. The local residents and fishermen set it up to protect the huge variety of marine life. Looking out to sea, I notice the area is now discoloured by a turquoise cloud. The village itself seems eerily deserted. There's hardly anyone on the streets or in the cafes and this is the tourist season on the Canaries. The holiday apartments and restaurants have been left empty since the latest eruption began almost six months ago, 
as the owner of this cafe explains. No, 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 hay mucha gente. Poca gente, a lo mejor, uh, there are hardly any tourists uh, now, says Demetria Orsini. It's because of the volcano. They're scared of a big eruption. It's the same story at the harbour. None of the fishing boats are in the water. They're all parked on dry land. There's no one about until I come to a little pool next to the harbour itself. This is the only place there are any fish left alive, this fisherman tells me. This is a small pool normally used for breeding fish. Jesus Machia tells me that the volcano has wiped out whole schools of fish. He's a third generation fisherman who's worked the boats for 15 years. In La Restinga alone, 40 families live off their catch. None of them have been out for months. We're desperate, he says, absolutely. We can't go to sea anymore. The divers can go to the harbour entrance, but there's nothing to do for us fishermen. There are no fish left all around the volcano. The fish market has closed. We're waiting for government aid. We can't go out in the boats again until the volcano has stopped erupting. It's complicated, he complains. So how does it look beneath the surface of this lifeless ocean? That's what I want to find out. Next morning, I meet up with Gunter Baumgartel. Originally from Austria, he's lived here for the past 14 years. He was drawn here by the diving. It used to be one of the best places in Europe to explore underwater. Once, there were nine diving schools here. Three of them have already closed down. Gunter Baumgartel has also seen revenues slump. He's living off savings, but he's not quitting yet. The volcano's 800 meters out, he explains. 200 meters from here is Spain's best known area for diving, El Bajon. It's a big outcrop of rock jutting out from the depths. It lies between 12 and 100 meters down. He says he hopes life will soon be able to return here. I'm not an experienced diver, but I do want to take a look below the surface. Trouble is, the sea here is discoloured by the turquoise cloud too. That's the sulphurous emissions from the volcano, Gunter explains. In the air, they form ash. Here, they go into the water. The sea carries them away depending on the current. They can go out into the ocean or end up on the coast and clear within hours. What about the marine life, I ask? That depends on the oxygen levels, he says. They need to be measured. It's not at all healthy for the marine life. The small particles get trapped in the fish's gills and makes it impossible for them to breathe. You'd have to ask a biologist if they're poisoned, but usually they die from the lack of oxygen. This green soup doesn't look too inviting, but we do finally find a clearer area and decide to dive. Yeah. We go down 20 meters. Everywhere are green sulfurous particles. Visibility is just a few meters and there's no sign of life. On the rocks, I can clearly see layers of sediment from the eruption. But here and there, there are some signs of life returning, 
in places where the particles are being carried away by the current. The first small sea creatures are back, pufferfish, lizardfish, algae. I even see a little moray eel. After an hour, we surface again. Alles okay? Yeah, that's good. Back at the diving school, Gunter and I take a look at our photos. He says he tried to record any signs of life that he saw. He hopes things will eventually return to how they were. But hope has nothing to do with it, he says. Nature always takes back the ground. And he hopes there'll be more life than there was before, because of all the algae, all the phosphates in the water. That leads to more small life forms, which serve as food for bigger creatures. And the larger they become, the larger the fish that will eat them in turn. He says he's looking forward to the day when the volcano stops erupting and he can experience all that happening. His hopes are shared by many here in La Restinga, but ultimately that all depends on El Discreto, and no one knows what it might have up its sleeve.